Coming to you live from the Vegas Video Network Studios, just steps from the Las Vegas Strip, it's Top of the Food Chain. And now your host, he's one part mohawk, two parts attitude, and a touch of what the f***, it's Al Mancini. exciting to be here because Scott is in the audience once again behind the board. Welcome to Top of the Food Chain on the Vegas Video Network. I am your host, Al Mancini, a man who honestly has never met a bartender he didn't like. But today I'm here with one that I think everybody in America loves, probably the best bartender in America, mixologist, whatever you want to call it. We'll get into that in a second. So stay tuned. It is time for a very alcohol-infused show. We, did <laughs> we had no alcohol on last week's show. First time ever with no alcohol because I was doing that food stamp challenge. So we're making up for it today with Tony Abu Ghanim. Worked out well that I wasn't here then. Yes, it, <laughs> good time to stay away, Scott. Um, anyway, you're on the Vegas Video Network, home of all the greatest Vegas programming that you will find anywhere. And you can find it just about anywhere. We are on YouTube, we are on iTunes, we are on Roku, we are on live stream. Every Friday night, they stream everything on the radio, KSHP 1400 AM, all night Friday night. So if you can't find our programming, you just are not trying. The best way to watch, however, is always live, because we've got the live chat going on right now. So if you're online, get into the live chat room and um, ask us some cocktail questions. In the meantime, if you have a question for a future show, you can email, email that to us. It's food at vegasvideonetwork.com. And we have a phone line. You can dial in with some questions. We'll record them. Like I said, I always like it when you call in and talk dirty to us. Um, it's 866-966-4599. What else do I have to promote? Oh, our great sponsor, Bread and Butter, over on Eastern Avenue. Chris Heron running probably one of the coolest breakfast, lunch, bakery shops here in town. Um, this guy was over running the bakery at Bouchon for seven years. If you can keep Thomas Keller happy with your pastries, you can pretty much keep anybody happy. It's a great little neighborhood joint over there in, um, in Henderson. And I highly recommend, I don't know what they're called, but there's this great little cinnamon knot thing that I had last time I was in there. So just ask him about that and tell them I sent you. He's really blowing up over there, too, it looks like. Yeah, it's doing great. Um, the RJ just wrote him up. Yep. Um, you know, I'm always happy when Heidi at the RJ actually latches on to some quality. Actually, I don't think Heidi wrote that one, but somebody at the RJ latched on to a really quality, you know, a talented gentleman, and I'm glad to see he's getting that kind of um, publicity. He deserves it. Yep. In the meantime, Scott, konnichiwa, my brother. I haven't been able to say that to you for two weeks. Where you been? I've uh, been in London doing a little work. Uh, it was hard to do some, uh, some video work in London, and uh, so did a little bit of that, a little bit of sightseeing with the soccer game, and and uh, went to Liverpool, the place where the Beatles played, hung out there for a while. It was fun. I hope you did not call it soccer. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> the truth is, we were afraid we were going to get beat up there. We were the away team. You should watch my show, because uh, they treat away team people very poorly there. Unlike America, where we're so welcoming to away team people? <laughs> Trust me when I tell you <laughs> that they basically make you walk into this little room, seriously, that only the away team goes. You're only allowed to be in one section. And then there's a gap between sections between the away team and the other team so they don't get too close to each other and fight. Because well, <laughs> they like to kill each other. Yeah, it was fun. It was they like to beat the hell out of each other. It was so. good. But it was a lot of fun to, to go. We had a chance to hang out with some real good friends of ours. So overall, the client liked it, I liked it, and the wife liked it. Well, cool, cool. Welcome back. Um, you. you know, I'd love to talk about what's been going on with both of us this week, but we have way too much show to get to. So um, enough of you, Scott. Be Thank gone. Thank you. Goodbye. We're going to um, cut to a little break, and we'll have Tony up in a second. I'm Courtney Leone. This is Vegas Video Network. You want me to mention awkward silence? Let's do that then. Okay. Never been on set here before. I'm always out live on location for Awkward Silence 2.1. I'm Courtney Leone, and you're watching the Vegas Video Network. We're good? Better? And welcome back to Top of the Food Chain. Once again, I'm your host, Al Mancini. And we are here to talk cocktails today. Oh. Sober show last week, it was a scene. I, I probably was the worst I've ever been without having a cocktail. But today, I have the king of cocktails, Tony Abu Ghanim. Abu Ghanim? Abu Ghanim. Abu Ghanim. Beautiful. Sorry, I get you it wrong, it. man. <laughs> you are, I mean, 
you know, Vegas is a town of mixologists. I mean, there's really a great cocktail resurgence in this town. And they look at you as if you're like the high priest or the pope or the god or I don't know. You're the king of cocktails. Oh, man, that's really kind. Um, I was the lucky cat that Steve Wynn turned to in 1998 to do a great, fresh cocktail program at the Bellagio. And, you know, it was a very lucky, blessed day for me, you know. So, um, but I mean, more than that, I mean, you're the man who invented the cable car, right? I did. I did invent the cable car. I did car. some research on you. <laughs> See, man, I called your friends today, found out some background on you. Cable car is a great drink. I mean, Thank some people you. think it's a little girly, but I like it. Oh, man. Men, women, everybody likes a cable car. It's just it's one of those solid drinks that goes back to the, you know, the early 1800s and a drink called the Brandy Crusta. So uh, it's, it's a simple drink that can be made. We're going to make it today. Okay. Let's not talk about it. Let's make it. Uh, okay. Well, let's make up a drink and get to chatting. But first, you've got this ice block here. And we were talking <laughs> a bit about ice and you know, how you work with Vegas tap water, for example, because we probably have the worst tap water in America, if you ask me. Awful, awful. Um, what I do is that this block of ice I made um, from reverse osmosis Las Vegas water. I freeze it in a little igloo cooler. It takes about three days to freeze. And then with my trusty Japanese ice saw, which everyone, I'm sure, has That's at home, right. uh, I cut away the bottom two-thirds, and I'm left with this beautiful block. Is that what they use in that new Drew Barrymore movie to rescue the whales, where they have to cut <laughs> the blocks of ice up? I think you could almost do that. But what I'm going to do just right now, I mean, because ice is the heart and soul of the cocktail. The cocktail is an um, ice I'm sorry, beverage. No. Booze is the heart and soul of the cocktail. It's, uh, um, you know, you're messing with my religion here, man. <laughs> it has been a week, I understand. Um, but, you, you know, if you have bad ice, the cocktail is going to suffer. So this is just hard, cold, crystal clear, beautiful ice. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to break it down, and I'm going to cut it into some big chunks. And we're going to serve the first drink over a big chunk of ice. And this is actually uh, the welcome drink for our pop-up dinner uh, with Jetilla on Wednesday. Yeah, you know, we've been talking about this pop-up, and pop-ups in general, a lot of my viewers getting a little interested in what is a pop-up. And again, this is when you get a chef, and, um, you know, and in this case, a mixologist, who don't normally operate out of a particular restaurant. And you kind of go there, and you do a special event one night only, two nights, something like that. You're doing, you and Jet Tila, who's you know, a good friend of mine, formerly of Wazuzu yep. at Wynn, or at Encore, I should say. And um, now he's doing a lot in LA. You guys are taking over Origin India, which is, I, I think, one of the, uh, probably the best Indian restaurant here in Las Vegas. But you're going to be doing Thai food and cocktails, right? We're, we're going to be doing Jet's, uh, he's going to do some street food, some Thai street food. And um, I'm doing the best I can to pair some classic Tony Abuganum cocktails with some twist. Uh, the first drink, you know, my favorite cocktail. A Negroni. A right? Negroni, yeah. Is it a coincidence that Negroni rhymes with Tony? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you named it. <laughs> I wish. Um, no. But um, this is going to be kind of, you know, playing into Jet's hand. I'm using some local, fresh, well, not local, but fresh citrus, um, seasonal citrus. So what I've done here is I've got some blood orange and caracara orange. So kind of some unique uh, juices. And by the way, just so I should tell people, this um, pop-up, which we were hoping to promote, that's next Wednesday at Origin India. But I was just told it's sold out, so nobody can get tickets, or should they, cry, should they try anyway? Next time? Okay. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Look but at how beautiful that is. That is nice. So we just, we're going to just do one quick cube in each glass. And next to the importance of booze and great ice, a great glass. And this is a glass that I actually designed. Uh, I have a new line coming out. Hopefully, uh, later this year, I've got a new line of bar tools, which your viewers are the first to actually see the new line. These are wow. the, the first unveiling of the tools. So I'm going to go ahead and use our jigger here, just because. Uh, you know, I've gotten to arguments with some other great mixologists. Some really love to measure everything, and they take great pride in it. And other guys that I know who here in town who have gone on and won major competitions, they like eyeballing things better. And they think, you know, the, the juice is always a little different, and the measurements should be adjusted accordingly. Are you a, a jigger guy or an eyeballing guy? Uh, well, you notice I didn't jigger the Campari, which is, uh, <laughs> um, I have a, basically, the sweet and sour elements are the most crucial to a balanced cocktail. Too much lime juice, the drink's going to be tart. Too much simple syrup or sweetener, the drink's going to be sweet. Too much booze. The drink's going to be good. The drink's going to be perfect. <laughs> so... Uh, so yeah, I'm a little more forgiving on that. Um, I think it's 
you know, after 31 years behind the stick, I, I pretty much have it down. Um, but I always encourage young bartenders getting into the profession, get in the habit of using the jigger, because you measure it's going to be consistent every time. Now, this is actually a new gin that's uh, only been uh, launched here in Nevada and New York City um, from Bombay. It's their east. So again, keeping with Jets food, Thai food, this is um, flavored with lemongrass and black peppercorns. So it, it's, again, taking the traditional Negroni, adding some fresh seasonal kind of citrus, and using this Asian-inspired... Of course, lemongrass, I mean, very big in Thai food. You know, I mean, it's just a, a key Thai ingredient. So it's, well, you're going to be at the dinner, right? I hope so. I don't know if I made a reservation. I thought I did, but it was a while ago. <laughs> I don't always call ahead. Sometimes I just show up places. Oh, this is going to be beautiful. So into the, the new Boston, which um, I designed a little differently than most Bostons. Oh, is that not the greatest sound? Sounds good. <laughs> uh, you know, you were, I saw you do a demo and recently. You were talking there's kind of a sweet spot to hit that to get it off, right, when you're doing a Boston shaker? Yeah, your sweet spot, when you make the seal... Um, and if you were to hold it kind of looking at you like this, Al, right, right here is the sweet spot. Okay. So all you need to do is pop your sweet spot, and the shaker comes pop right her. apart. Okay. And then this is, my, oh, this is my design again on this Hawthorne strainer, which I'm really excited about, which fits in beautifully here, and we're just going to pour that out over that beautiful block. Oh, you're going to like this. I'm ready. <laughs> it's too bad your viewers don't have taste of vision. Yes. Well, they could always come down and watch live, and we always share the booze with them. Is that right? Food. I'm going to be a regular on your show. Come down any week, man. Absolutely. They, we have a very nice bar back there, actually. <laughs> We're just going to give that a quick little garnish. Uh, the blood orange is looking oh. beautiful. I mean, I don't know if people can see that, but is, is this a good season for blood oranges right now? This is the only season. Yeah. yeah. It's a winter fruit. That's for you, buddy. Thank I know you, you were... Five days in coming. And this is so. called what? This is just a, a, a Tony Negroni. You know, this yeah. is a fun play on a classic. So happiness. Oh man, that's good. Oh, that is really good. I mean, the citrus plays so beautifully. Um, Campari loves orange, so it's a beautiful marriage. And it's just, you know, it's just. So this is going to be the welcome uh, drink at the pop-up dinner on Wednesday, and Very cool. then we're going to go into uh, three other drinks, but. Uh, yeah, we'll be drinking quite a bit. It's going to be a good night. Um, it looks like we've got a question. Scott, you got somebody over there? Yeah, a couple. First one, do mixologists taste each drink like a chef would taste each dish? Ah. Or is measuring your only means of quality control? Well, um, my mom, who was a great cook and entertainer, she always said, Tony, never trust a skinny chef. You have to taste everything. Um, which hopefully doesn't translate to never trust a sober, a sober bartender. bartender. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I can agree with that. I don't trust sober bartenders. <laughs> but I mean, there, uh, I believe in tasting, especially when you're developing a new recipe. Uh, the only way really to know, I can come up with most of it in my head, mm -hmm. but I need to put it in the glass and then I need to taste it and to tweak the ingredients. So you just grab a little straw each drink that goes out? I mean... A little straw taste is, is good. Um, you know, I don't know in service if you need to taste every single drink. <laughs> right. But you mentioned it earlier. I mean, one time of the year the lemons might be a little more tart, a little more acidic. Um, maybe that lemon juice is a little older. So there's a lot of variables in that. I mean, Campari is going to be Campari is going to be Campari. Right. Uh, but yeah, I'm a big fan of tasting things. And I mean, even, you know, your blended taste whiskeys, this. your blended whiskeys, of course, are pretty much always going to taste very similar. But when you're dealing with, you know, single barrel whiskeys, I mean, you're going to get a different taste from bottle to bottle, right? Absolutely. And, you know, citrus vodkas, you know, every citrus vodka is not the same. Gins, that's what identifies the profile of gin are the botanical mixtures that each producer uses. So if you don't taste those, I mean, if I made this Negroni with Beefeater or Plymouth, as opposed to the uh, sapphire, it's going to be a different... But a beef eater is going to taste the same day to day. Absolutely. Whereas, like I said, if you get to say a Jack Daniels single barrel, it's going to taste completely different because each bottle has a very distinct profile. And I've done that. I've been down to Lynchburg, and we've gone through a vertical tasting of barrels, all destined to be single barrel, all Jack Daniels, but all just slightly unique. Yeah. And, and that's what's wonderful about that. And that's the beauty, I mean, you know, because bars can go down there. They can go to Lynchburg, and mm -hmm. they can actually pick out their barrel. And I don't know how many bottles you get out of a barrel, but you could have your, your barrel that you bring back to your bar. 
or heavy alcoholics could do that too. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they do sell them personally. Yeah. You're right. Uh, every barrel is going to vary a little bit as the evaporation differs, but about 250 bottles to a barrel. Uh, and, and we've, when I was at Bellagio, I think we were at like 22 barrels, the number one account in the world wow. for single barrel. Yeah. Scott, another question. Yeah, with the new infused alcohols like bacon vodka, do you find that you have more issues making drinks for vegetarians or people who have allergies? Uh oh. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're a vegetarian, you're probably not going to be drinking bacon vodka. Uh, I'm not, I, I want my bacon on a cheeseburger. Or oh, no, no. You know what? I'm sorry. I'm friends with the man who invented the bacon martini. T Moss at the Double Down <laughs> I Saloon. Know. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that is a Las Vegas creation, it, the it bacon is. martini. And the coolest punk rock bar, I actually dragged John Curtis down there and made him drink one of those the other day. And wow, it was, it was rough watching him get that down. <laughs> but yeah, that, uh, no, you're not a bacon martini fan, huh? You know, I, 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 I'm a, I like everything, but. It, I'm a classic guy. I, I love a great gin martini. And matter of fact, we got the makings here for a beautiful gin martini. If you, I'm definitely going to do one of those. I want to take you through, though. We talk about the classics. And right now, this is what everybody, I'd say the past five years here in Las Vegas, all we hear about is classic cocktails, mm -hmm. prohibition, pre-prohibition. You know, um, some incredible cocktail programs here in town. Uh, I was just asked to pick a bartender of the year for um, for. Desert Companion, I believe, or Luxury Las Vegas, I forget which magazine. And I actually went with somebody doing modern because I've gotten bored of these classic cocktails. Okay. It seems to have really exploded in the past few years. And great programs at places like American Fish. Of course, Bellagio has a great program. Um, you know, uh, Sage has an incredible program. Um, a couple other restaurants, uh, Kamsa, you know. They, but everyone's going back to these classic cocktails. You and your book, you kind of break down the, the cocktail eras. So mm -hmm. can we throw that up on the screen and maybe you could describe these eras just in a few words to people? Well, absolutely. And, and you mentioned prohibition, which I believe really has been the downfall of our industry. I think we're now recovering from that. But our society, if you ask me. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, all the great cocktails were either created or perfected prior to Prohibition. So the Gothic Age, Age is what you talk of as the, the original. And that's we're going back to colonial Williamsburg days, exactly. right? Exactly. Back to, you know, um, punches. Punches, you know, predates cocktails. Um, things like uh, slings and... Because you didn't have ice. You know, we, we take for granted that we have this beautiful ice now to work with. Right. But it wasn't always there. I mean, back before the Industrial Revolution, if you were going to have ice, you cut it from a frozen lake. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Mark Twain said about ice, ice was like diamonds, only the wealthy could wear it. <laughs> because imagine this a chunk of ice being cut up north from a lake, put on a flatbed, right. wrapped in hay, and shipped to New Orleans. So, so then you, you, the next era that you talk about is the golden age, right? Start, yeah. Starting in the 1840s. What made that such a golden age for cocktails? Well, that's when all the beautiful saloons opened up in St. Louis and New York City and San Francisco. That's when the, you know, the art of the professional bartender was really at its peak when a bartender would spend a minimum two years of, in an apprenticeship before he would step up to the stick and make a drink for a guest. And I mentioned, you know, that's when all the great classics were either invented or perfected. And we really, like I said, prohibition came along and ended the golden age. Right. And, and then prohibition, everything sucked. So that's when we really started to kind of mask the flavor because you weren't getting quality. I mean, in your book, you say, and by the way, the Modern Mixologist, incredible book. Everyone who's interested in cocktails should definitely pick up a copy. Um, but you know, you say it really, it's all about the quality of what you're starting with. is your alcohol and your ingredients, your juices. And in Prohibition, it was crap. I mean, you know, people were making it in their bathtubs, right? I mean, yeah, some of it was coming over the Canadian border, but right. how much can you make with Seagram's, really, you know? Well, it was, uh, again, you can't build a Ferrari out of Ford parts. I mean, you don't have quality liquors to work with, but what you really didn't have was the professional barman. Because when Prohibition went into effect, the great barman of that era um, either got out of the profession or a lot of them went to Europe and set up American bars, London, Paris. So we had a real, real um, deficit of, of talented bartenders because of a bartender before in the golden age, right. too proud to work in a speakeasy. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've got people that, I mean, speakeasies were run by who? Well, there were some great speakeasy bartenders who, you know, I've, I've heard some stories of guys <laughs> whose fathers worked in them and, you know, great stuff. So 
Before we get on, as much as I'm enjoying the Negroni, you're going to show me how to make a proper martini, right? I'm, I'm going to show you how I like to drink them, and, okay. and which is stirred and rather wet. Yeah, because James Bond is sort of an ass, right, when he says shake and not <laughs> stirred? I mean, every, you know, he's so pretentious about it, but it really just waters it down by shaking up the ice, right? Well, a lot of it, again, is, it comes back to the quality of the ice itself. Um, and unfortunately, most restaurant, hotel bars, uh, you know, the ice machines make ice very quickly. So it's soft ice, it's wet ice, and it's warm ice. So it dilutes really quickly. And yes, shaking it is going to dilute it even more so. But a, a martini is silky. You know, it should be velvety. It should be liquid satin. OK, so th let's do one of them. Let me do one of these bad boys up. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to load you up with some of this ice that I cut. And this is just some beautiful ice. How do you usually uh, take yours as far as proportions? Um, I usually just let my bartender do it for me. <laughs> so you I honestly, I'm not a huge gin drinker. And, you know, I mean, I think, you know, at this point, people, uh, the martinis kind of become bastardized because everybody drinks vodka martinis. Right. You know, um, so, okay, so we start off with some ice, That's quite a bit. Some beautiful, beautiful crystal hand. clear hand <laughs> cut sawed with a Japanese whale saving saw. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, what do we do? We All right. Now, for everybody at home who has a bottle of dry vermouth in their liquor cabinet that's been there for the last three years, throw it away. Uh, get rid of it because it, it's an aromatized wine. Uh, vermouth will really shows best for about a month after you've opened it. So next time you buy a bottle of vermouth, after you've opened it, store it in the refrigerator. Treat okay. it like a wine. So, okay. so now how much am I putting in here? Well, Bernard DeVoto, who wrote The Hour, said that the Perfect dry martini happens with a harmonious dry or gin and a, and a beautiful vermouth at 3.7 to 1. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, my, I don't know how good my eyeballing is in that instance. All right. So, th yeah, I, I found it a little arrogant to ask a bartender to make a martini 3.7 right. to 1. So I'm 4 to 1. Okay. So 20% of my martini is vermouth. Mm -hmm. So if you, don't, if you have bad turned oxidized vermouth. Right. It's going to be not a quality product. Right. Okay. So we're going to make two. So fill it up to the top of the jigger there, which is going to give you a, a pony measure or one ounce. Okay. All the way, yeah. Oh, I'm pouring it in there, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay. And then four times as much gin. And I wouldn't use the jigger. I would just, I'll, I'll help you out here. Okay, you let me know. Normally I just drink it out of the bottle, but okay. We'll have some <laughs> class. So what do we got there? Two, three, four. Little, no, keep going. One more. We're making two. That's perfect. All right. Okay. I like the way you measure. <laughs> I just pour and let other people tell me things. Now, I've designed two different spoons. And you'll notice the, the end, it's not a typical shape of a spoon, so that the end of the spoon actually hugs the side of the glass. OK, yeah. So do you, are you a twisted guy or a straight guy? Spoon-wise. I mean, um, I know you're twisted. Um, but <laughs> twisted? Yeah, I'm absolutely a twisted right, guy. Let's go with the twisted. OK. So now, I mean, uh, what is the way that you use a spoon like this? You just stir it around? Well, you don't just stir it. OK, well, it's, tell it's, me. You're the expert, man. I mean, I'm it's, just the drunk. It's, <laughs> it's, yeah. So it's not your grandmother's oatmeal cookies that you're stirring there. It's a, uh, OK, hold it like this, Al. This? Like this, like a cigarette. I don't know if you ever smoked, mm, but... Uh, not cigarettes, but I have uh, been known to smoke a few things. Okay, in my day. different grip altogether. But you just, you don't want to move your hand. You just move your fingers. And you just, okay, what you need to do is you need to imagine Frank Sinatra playing in your head. <laughs> You're wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> All right. Okay, we doing okay here? Yeah, maybe... No. It's a good thing that you stick to having your bartender make it. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, come on. I don't tell you how to do TV. You don't tell me how to pour drinks, okay? Touche. <laughs> All right. So now we have Why is the spoon twisted like this, though? I mean, you know, people see that. What, what is the, the need for that twisting? Again, it's a personal preference. Um, I like the straight uh, barrel style spoon. But it's, it's, again, how it feels between your fingers and how it helps you to stir the drink. That's all it has to do with. Um, I mean, I can do it probably equally as good. I am going to let you pour these, and then we're going to go to a quick break, and we'll be drinking them when we come back. But now, just explain very quickly, you need a strainer at this point. It's a different kind of strainer than you originally had. Right. This strainer is referred to as a julep strainer. Uh, and again, it dates back 
to the 1800s when dentistry was not really what it is today. So people, when they had ice drinks, they would put the, if they had bad teeth, put the julep strainer in so the ice didn't come in contact with their teeth. Okay. Hence the julep strainer. Um, and it's a strainer we use for stirred drinks, not shaken drinks, because okay. uh, how beautifully it sits right there. Okay. And then we have our beautiful cocktail or martini glass. Which, of course, you put the ice in first and you dump it out so it gets nice and chilled. Right. Cold drink, cold glass. Oh, that's gorgeous. Now you've got onions, not olives, which makes this a Gibson rather than a martini, right? That's it. I'm a Gibson lover, so we're going to just put a single pearl onion in there. I'm going to cut a little bit of, of lemon zest because I love lemon in, an, in a martini. And we're going to just kind of express those oils over the top. Oh, you can smell that. How beautiful. Yum. And... Uh, and there see, you don't have. pour the, no, you don't fill this all the way up, which is good because, you know, I got a little carpal tunnel sometimes. If I'm trying to hold a martini glass, you know, it'll be like <laughs> pouring. But you, so you're not supposed to fill it right to the brim. Well, this is a big thing that Steakhouse has got us accustomed to, these, you know, mega 10, 12-ounce martini glasses. Martinis are always short and snappy, two and a half to three and a half ounce glasses. So really, that is the proper pour so that your martini is ice cold from the first sip to the last sip. And you can have the three martini lunch. Right? And then you can have the three martini lunch. Well, cheers. There you are, my brother. Happiness. Yeah, much better when you make it. <laughs> oh, you did good. If man. I were to do that on my own, it wouldn't have been good. We're going to be back. We got one more drink to make. Um, we're going to trade out some of this fun stuff, and we'll be talking more cocktail tips in just a second. But first, a word from our people. Traditional media believes that after about three minutes, you'll tune out. Most Vegas media companies think if it doesn't jiggle, you won't tune in. At the Vegas Video Network, we think both are wrong. The Vegas Video Network is the first and only live online broadcast network that specializes in insider news and expert views about Vegas. We combine great storytelling with the ability to watch when and where you want on your computer, mobile device, or television. Discover the real Las Vegas. Visit VegasVideoNetwork.com. I do have good timing, don't I, Scott? <laughs> That was well done. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm loving this martini. Oh. And I know we got one more drink to make, but I do want to talk to you, I guess, a bit. You know, we went through the eras, and the, you have an era there you call the spritzer age, <laughs> then, which is relatively recent in our yes. lifetimes. Did cocktails just start to suck around the 70s and 80s? It, they really did. It was, I mean, a really bad time. It's because drugs were coming into fashion, so nobody was, you know, everybody was just getting high. And no, you're you know? absolutely right. We were rebelling against anything that our parents drank. We were smoking weed. I mean, we were drinking fruity Vodka-based drinks, uh, the Fuzzy Naval, the Harvey Wallbanger were popular, disco was big, but the cocktail scene, and I really, as I said, feel that the profession of bartending has just now gotten back from Recovery. prohibition. So if you don't have great people mixing drinks, right. it's hard to have a great drink. Um, we've got another question, Scott. Yeah, can you pair cocktails with food like you do with wine oh. and... Would there be one cocktail that really goes with everything? Well, I mean, obviously my favorite cocktail is the Negroni. It's a simple classic, dates back to 1919, uh, Florence, Italy, equal parts gin, Campari, and sweet vermouth. I think it's the, the, a wonderful food drink. And yeah, our dinner uh, with Jet is doing just that. I'm pairing a cocktail with his food. So I'm trying to get a lot of acidity in to kind of play against the spiciness uh, of his food. But another great drink, and a drink that I'm, we're not making today, but we're serving at the pop-up dinner on Wednesday, is a twist. I call it the Jet 75, to pay tribute again. I'm making a syrup from lemongrass, and you said, so again, complimenting his food. But the French 75 is another fabulous food drink that uh, I love to pair with just about anything. And, and you know, there are, there are certain restaurants, if you go into, you feel like you have to have a wine pairing mm -hmm. or pick a bottle of wine. And I think a good sommelier, though, should really be in touch with his mixologist and making good cocktail pairings. And I will grant you, if I'm at Robichon or if I'm at Guy Savoie, no, I probably won't ask for cocktails. But, you know, there are certain restaurants when I'll ask 
for a cocktail pairing. And hopefully, if it's a good restaurant, they do have a good mixologist. Do you right. find that the fine, how, how do you feel fine dining restaurants, and French in particular, because that's, of course, the world mm -hmm. of fancy wines, how, how do you feel that the, the fine dining world is, has embraced in the past, say, decade, mixologist and cocktails? I think uh, any great restaurant who isn't paying attention to their mixology cocktail program is missing a crucial element of the overall dining experience. Because I'm with you. When I get into the meal, I'm going to have wine. But I'm never going to go out to dinner and not go to the bar and have a martini or a Negroni or some type of an aperitif. So it's, it's to me, it's the opening act of the show. Right. If I have a great experience with the cocktail, generally it puts me in a pretty good mood for the rest of the meal. And I've actually left places because I had such a bad experience at the bar, I canceled my dinner reservation and, and went somewhere else. You have one more drink to make. So yes, I do. St get started on that one because we are running low on time. And All then right. I'll chat with you a bit about what you're making and about other things in the cocktail world. Um, you, you do have this new line of bar tools, though. I want to ask you sort of as, you, as you're making this drink for us, um, how many bar tools do you really need to make quality cocktails at home? Well, the, my set and what I do really is geared at the home mixologist because I really want people to be comfortable making cocktails at home. And if you have this basic set that I've put together, which is the Boston Cobbler Shaker set, a couple of strainers, a couple of spoons, um, a jigger, a lime squeezer, which is right there, a muddler. You pretty much have things covered to make 95% of the drinks you'll ever need to make. Is, is muddled fruit and muddled herbs, is that a new thing? Because it seems everyone's doing it right now, and I don't remember 10 years ago a lot of people, other than maybe if you um, had a, what am I thinking of? South American, where you muddle the limes. Caipirinha. Caipirinha, yes. Absolutely. But it, it seems like now everybody's muddling everything. Well, I mean, when I started bartending in 1980, the only time you brought out the muddler was the occasional old-fashioned, or if you had an unruly guest, and you need to... <laughs> right. I mean, it was... Um, but as the profession, again, has continued to explode and this resurgence, yeah, muddling is a great way to infuse flavor into a drink, and it's a crucial tool both for the professional and for the home mixologist. So now, of course, you're doing this right here. You've lined the glasses with, is that just sugar? It's actually uh, sugar that's infused with cinnamon. And uh, this is actually... Which is what you'll find on a cable car. Is this, is this the cable car this, you're making for us? We're making the cable car, okay. uh, which is, again, a drink that I'll be serving. I think that just needs just a little more Sailor Jerry here, just to... Sailor Jerry <laughs> is practically a sponsor of this network, I think. <laughs> we drink it every week here. Um, yeah, this is the, the, the cable car. I created it in 1996 at the Starlight Room in San Francisco because our tagline was between the stars and the cable cars. We were right on the Knob Hill cable car track. And uh, it's, you know, it's probably my best known drink, and it's one that I'll be doing with Jet at the dinner uh, on Wednesday. It's got to be amazing. I mean, you know, to invent a dish, uh, excuse me, a drink, much like, you know, you don't know of many chefs who invented a particular dish, but, you know, and... At the same time, most of these cocktails, most cocktails have been around forever. Yeah. Places have signature cocktails. A restaurant will have its own, but for something to have caught on the way that the cable car, I mean, you can get that in any bar in America. I mean, that's, that's just cool. <laughs> it is cool. I, I got to tell you, when I see it on a menu somewhere or someone calls me about the recipe or, you know, I had a cable car last night, I loved it. Thank you. Uh, I mean, it's just... Does it piss you off you don't get royalties? How cool would that be? Wouldn't that be nice if like a nickel <laughs> out of every cable car sold had to go to you? I, 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 let's vote for that. I, I would love it. But again, it's a real simple drink. What I, I made was a fresh lemon sour. The fresh lemon sour was two parts fresh squeezed lemon juice, one part simple syrup. I added orange curacao as my modifier and again the uh, Sailor Jerry spice rum at the base. We've rimmed the glass with super fine sugar and cinnamon, which is the key spice in the spiced rum, and to play on the orange and the orange curacao, just to, oh, and you express those oils so beautifully on top there. You mentioned the word modifier. There's two, there's another word you use in your book, too. There's your base, and then you have modifiers and something accents, I believe, was it? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the difference between a modifier and an accent? Well, sometimes they can be interchangeable, but if we look at a drink like the Manhattan, which is a great example of the three, the base spirit is our rye whiskey. Right. The modifier is um, our sweet vermouth. And the accent 
the salt and pepper, if you will, is the Angostura bitters. So that's uh, perhaps the best example of, of how those fall into those categories. Like I said, sometimes the two can be interchangeable, but a cocktail should always be about the base spirit. Everything there is to make it more than just the sum of the parts. Right. A margarita should be about tequila, and the cable car should be about spice rum. My friend? Cheers. Happiness. Seriously, people, when you get to have a drink by the man who <laughs> invented it, handmade for you on your own show, this is why I do what I do. <laughs> this is honestly, I mean, an honor and a delicious, I mean, un unreal, man, unreal. Thank you. You're making, um, you're writing another book, and I understand it's primarily about vodka? It's entirely about vodka, because um, I'm kind of upset with the way we're perceiving vodka these days. Um, and also, I think that most people don't have a perception and an appreciation and an understanding of vodka. Because what brought vodka into its popular state is the mixability of it. It's supposed to be a completely neutral spirit that brings nothing to the table, isn't it? I mean, well, it wasn't that kind of the... It was to get women drunk. I mean, was, isn't that where <laughs> vodka came from? Like, the chicks wouldn't drink the real booze, so we just gave them something that didn't taste like anything, and you poured juice in it, and you could get chicks drunk. Is, am I wrong with my I, perception of the history of vodka? Um, I mean, it was definitely, in big part, <laughs> it made mixing drinks a lot easier because you didn't have a lot of flavor there to balance. And what you said is really the U.S. definition of vodka is a tasteless, colorless, odorless spirit. But in the EU, it's a little bit different. And that's what I want to get across in this book, that as subtle as the nuances are, the differences are, they're there, and if you explore it, and when I, w I was just in Poland doing some research, I, I know I've got the worst job in the yeah, world. Yeah, it's a rough job. You have to drink your way around the world, huh, man? <laughs> but I was in Poland uh, with my dear friend Simon Ford, and we, uh, when we'd go out to dinner, it wasn't a bottle of wine with dinner. It was a bottle of vodka with dinner. Oh, I've done that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not at a club. This right. was the, but the food. I actually did a um, vodka pairing of, of a caviar tasting dinner once. Oh. Eight courses of caviar, each with a different vodka. It was good, but I don't remember the last three courses. Three courses. Is, <laughs> <laughs> and th but it's amazing. How I'm, and I'm sure, because I've done that before, different vodka shows so different with different caviars. Well, vodka is a very difficult spirit for me to get oh. people to define what it is, because... You know, for example, you know, brandy has to come from wine. It comes from grapes. Right. And um, you know, sugar is the base of all of your rum. Some right. sugar, for, I mean, obviously sugar is involved in all alcohol, but you know, uh, molasses or cane sugar or something like that in rums. Vodka, it seems like you can make from anything. So what is the definition of vodka? Well, that's one thing that they're struggling with in the EU is they want to identify it with the classic traditional ingredients, wheat, rye, potato that it should come from a grain or a potato. Um, and they've kind of come up a little against a little... Well, like Ciroc is a, right. is a grape vodka, right? Yeah. So, and that's a French vodka. That's a French vodka. And there are several you know, grape vodkas that are on the market. But like you said, it, it can be made from any fermentable sugar. So uh, is its characteristic really simply the fact that it is just kind of the pure alcohol in its pure form? It doesn't take anything from the barrels? It, it stays clear? It stays kind of pure to what it was? It's out there naked, and again, that's why I think the, the more I've I mean, really looked into the category writing this book, the more fascinated I am with it. And I'm hoping that you know, Americans will read the book and they will enjoy vodka on its own. I mean, for me, the best way to drink vodka is straight from the freezer in a frozen vodka glass and just watch it kind of uh, expose itself. Doing a little of that last night, as a matter of fact. But, um... <laughs> Now, vodka has to be kept in the freezer. I mean, right? I mean, don't you? That that's the way to keep it. Well, that, that's best. Again, I, I that's the way I enjoy it the best. If I'm going to make it into a martini style drink, and I, I agree with you, I, I think the vodka martini should be called something else. It should be called a shot of vodka. It that's could, what, you know, a really big shot of vodka because that's yeah. what it is for the most part. I mean, do you put? Okay, uh, we are running out of time, but. When you make a vodka martini, is it just straight vodka, or do you use vermouth? I don't think it? vermouth works with vodka at all. Right. So I mean, really, a vodka martini is just a big glass of vodka. Well, and 20% water coming from your wonderful hand-cut ice. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, anyway, man, Tony, it has been incredible to have you on. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah.
Again, the book right now that's out, The Modern Mixologist, and it's a must-have for anybody that likes cocktails. I've got an autographed version here. It's <laughs> so cool. You sign this for me. Oh, I can't find it, but sign it for me at the Mandarin, as I a matter of fact. And your, your website, modernmixologist.com. Anything you need to know. Seriously, people, look this guy up. I mean, when it comes to booze, you are, you've won like every award, and oh, you're, you're you. just the, the god of cocktails, man. And that's a good thing to be god of, really. It's, uh, um, in the meantime, you can follow what I'm doing on my website, almancini.net. And you can follow me on Twitter, and that's Almancini Vegas. We will be back next week. I do not know what we will be talking about, but um, I can promise you, I'm going to steal some of this booze, and we're going to have it here. So we're going to have a good time. <laughs> Cheers. I'll talk to you guys later. Thanks, man.